The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. So, hello everybody. Um, our today's webinar um, is covering the file location table, which is part of the inspector. Um, me, Martina Prozzo, I am the presenter today. And um, on my side, I have Mike, and he will answer your questions and help me out if I'm stuck somewhere. <laughs> so, hello, <Everyone>. Mike. <laughs> um, so, let's get right into it. The overview of today's webinar is, um, yeah, we are talking about the file location table. So, um, where can we find it and what can I do with it? Um, afterwards, we are talking um, about file handling in Pandora's box and the spreading feature. Um, we will then dive in and have a look what is all the information that I can get out of the file location table and what are the options from it. One of the options in the table is the attaching option. And this is actually quite a powerful feature and I will give you some examples um, how you can use it. And also talk a little more about one use case where I've um, used the attach function quite a lot. And at the end, um, I will have a look at the timer. Um, I will make a small excursion um, with how Pandora's box is caching files because we will see in um, the file location table that uh, it tells us uh, that there are some file paths but even when I delete sometimes um, those file paths even then the file is still shown and this has led to some confusion in, in the past and I just want to clear things up and explain why all this is happening. Um, so let's get started. Um, where I can I find the file location table. Um, the file location table is uh, can be found at the bottom um, from the various inspectors, for example, from the file inspector or from other ones um, when you click on a resource in the project tab. So when you drag um, content from the assets tab into the project tab, select it there, then have a look in the file inspector and scroll all the way down, this is where you can find the file location table. What's it for? Well, it gives us an overview of the location and the status of a file and provides options to manage it system-wide. And manage is meant in terms of file management. So the file location table is, is like the heart of the file management, not, not maybe the heart, maybe the, the brain from the file management. It um, structures everything, there's all the logic behind it, and um, it knows exactly where the files are and um, gives us an overview. So when we talk about file management, we also need to talk about the file handling of Pandora's box and the spreading function. I tried to keep it short, but I realized after a while there is just no way around it. We have to, to dive deep into it. Um, so let's do that. Um, file handling. As soon as you drag a file from the assets tab into the project tab, or you do the same from the thumbnails tab, or you use widget designer or any other method, um, um, as soon as you have content in here in the project tab, um, the project simply saves a link to the file location on the hard drive. And this is very, very important to know. We do not copy the, um, the content physically somewhere else. Um, um, we simply remember the location from where you have dragged it in and save this link. This is all. The spreading, however, if you, um, after importing the content, um, Panora's box is automatically spreading all the files to the system that are available in the network. And this spreading means that a hard copy of the file is created on the respective systems. So each file is taken from, for example, from the local machine and it's copied through the network to all the other machines and it's saved there as a hard copy. So it exists multiple times on each system. Automatically, I've added a small asterisk so up here, is meant when you leave the default um, settings of Pandora's box. 
So in the configuration tab under resources, you have here the checkbox auto spread resources after adding to project. And this is checked per default. Um, and this means as soon as you have files in the project tab, Pandora's box knows, um, okay, I have to copy this file to all the other machines as well. Um, in the project, however, as we've talked about before, only the link is saved. And the link we listed in the file location table. Now, per default, the um, we try to mimic the, um, the the location. So, if you have one location on the on the source um, system, we try to also create it on the target system. However, this is a little more complicated. So, we need to also have a look at the spreading paths. Um, I've simply copied this table from the manual. I will show it to you later where you can find it. Per default, this is most likely to be our source path. Um, on hardware from, uh, from Christy, uh, for years we had this as the default um, content place. So under C, Kulak's content, we had a, a um, back then it was a um, partition that we mounted and called it the content. So we uh, used to always uh, talk about the content partition. Since um, since some time, <laughs> we use now rates that we um, mount there. So uh, this is why you sometimes hear about the word content partition and sometimes um, the, the rate, um, the, the content rate, um, but it more or less means the same. So we always talk about this uh, content folder. Um, if you um, had content in the Kulox folder, um, and spread it, it went to this target path as well. Since version 6.4.0 now, we decided to finally take the step and um, call our content folder um, also Christy. Um, this is because the version 6.4.0 now is installed under a new um, installation path called Christy. So we thought this is now the perfect time and we finally had to take the step and also call our content um, folder Christy. However, of course, we know that all the 99% um, of, of the hardware um, available still uses this Coolox content folder. So we, of course, um, cared for compatibility. And so this means if you have a Christy folder already on your hardware, because it's a newer hardware, and you spread content, what is happening on the target machine is first we look, is there a Christy folder, Christy content folder? If yes, use it and put the content there. If it's not there, use have a look whether there is the C Kulox content folder. If yes, use it. If no, then go back and create this Christy folder. Vice versa, it's happening in the same order. So if you have, for example, a manager that still uses the Kulox content folder, it's the same logic. Is there a Christy folder? If yes, use it. If no, is there a Kulox one? If yes, use it. If no, create the Christy folder. If you drag content from a different folder into the project, um, there, is, uh, there are two possibilities. Either um, we create this different folder and, um, and save the file there, or we have a look uh, whether, actually this is done first, of course. Um, we first uh, check whether there is a Christy content or Kulox content partition uh, or folder. And if there is one, then we go into it. Um, there is already a folder which is called Pandora's Box Data, remote content. And in this folder, we now create the different folder uh, that we saw down here. This is done <clears throat> in order to make sure that we do not overload um, the other drives. Um, and especially uh, that we do not take too much space up so that the operating system cannot work anymore. Um, with the newest hardware, with the, uh, where the 
uh, where this is actually a content rate. It's actually like this, that the entire operating system sits somewhere totally different. And if you have uh, spread, for example, too much content or maybe um, too many cached files or so, and it totally over overloads the entire drive, the operating system can still work and because it has it sits somewhere else and is not influenced by this by this thing, so this is why we uh, do this. Um, yeah, why we choose this log logic behind it. Of course, you can not only go to a different folder or take content from a different folder, but you could of course also use a different drive. Um, for example, um, with an external drive, if you or if you have mounted a um, uh, a NAS, a, a network server. Um, if this is the source path, we first um, of all check whether there is the, the content uh, partition or rates. So we take the, uh, the same logic as we have seen above here. We go into our content folder and structure it like this and take the um, folder which we have seen on the source path here. If there is no such a content partition, we simply save it under C, the default um, uh, default drive. Last part on this table here, um, there's a specialty. Um, if you save your project, you will see that there is an assets folder in the same location. If you copy your content there and then drag it into the Pandora's box project, you will see that you will have um, this written in the file location table. We will just do it in in a couple of uh, yeah in a minute or so um, in Panos box ourselves. So this is what we will see then. If this is a source path, um, you will either have C Christie or C Kulak's content, and then the project path and the assets one um, back here. So this is why you might see different um, paths in your file location table. And this is the explanation behind it. Now we are at the point that we can actually have a look at the file location table and look what kind of information I find in there and what options I see. Um, I will not just make a little break because I'm switching from the PowerPoint presentation um, over to Pandora's box. Um, no, I've talked some some minute. Um, is there anything un, unclear? Maybe you can um, write Mike um, a question if I should go back and make something a little more clear. Otherwise, I will just now switch to Pandora's box. I, I think you can go on this. No questions so far. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> again, a little excited. I thought I would not be. <laughs> it's just a different situation when you are online. <laughs> um, my Pandora's Box project. Um, here I have simply a, um, a, new, a new empty project, nothing in here, only my compact player sits in here. I've chosen the setup like this, that here I have the VNC remote and all what you see, actually, just to show you, it's just the VNC um, remote and uh, this is the window preview from it. So here you can see what's happening on the client. Um, ah, Martina, I, mm -hmm. uh, we got a question yep. here. Um, is there a recommended location for project files from the manager? Um, what I do is I also use the, the Kulox folder as, as one. Um, I don't have any mounted uh, partition or rates in here. So I just simply created the folder. So see Kulox content and um, they have all my, my images and video and so in there. Um, if you have a 
dedicated project, um, which this is the only thing that you will work on, um, we will have a look at the assets path in a second. Um, I've mentioned it already. Uh, it was the last part of the of the table just now. Um, this gives us uh, another flexibility, but I will talk about it in a second. Thank you. Um, otherwise, uh, just as a side note, for a long time it was recommended that all the content should be first copied to the manager and should be then dragged from the manager into the project path, um, uh, into the project tab, and, and then spread to the clients. This recommendation, however, um, is not valid anymore. Um, there is no, no problem or no issue if you start tracking content or if you physically copy it only to the client, for example, and um, use it as an attached file or drag it from the client to the project with or without auto spread on. So it doesn't really make a difference anymore what the, what the source path or the source system was from this file. So if you have heard it um, or still stick to the recommendation, um, it's, um, you don't have to anymore. <laughs> um, So what I wanted to show you is the file location table. Um, so here I have my compact player and let's just start uh, with getting some content. So on my manager, I go to CCLOX content and I'm simply just taking here a, an image. Let's for example, take this one. And what you will see down here in this um, status bar, uh, it will show you that the content is spread because on the configuration window, my auto spread function is on, which is the default setting. So when I put it in here, right now it's loaded after it was spread to the compact player. And when I select it in the project um, top, have a look on the inspector and scroll all the way down, I see now two entries. The first one is my local machine, my manager, and here I see the same path as I've chosen up here, of course. So I went to see Colox Content Images, and this is the name from, uh, from the file. On my compact player, however, I see that it's the Christy Content Images. Because on my compact player, I back then decided with version 6.4.0 that I want to mimic the situation from the new hardware, and I simply renamed my C Kulax content folder to C Christy content. So here we see the logic that I've just displayed in the table um, on the first line. Um, if I, for example, take a different file path, which was our second line. If I simply go, for example, um, 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 let's take some help file. Uh, I have a lot of images in here. A lot of images. <laughs> So if I just uh, take, for example, this file, drag it down here, the same um, pattern happens. It's spread and loaded. So when I now click on the new file, I see here that my source path is the help file folder. But on my target location, I now got this really long, um, long path because it's spread to the it's not directly saved on the help file folder over there because um, Converse Box detected that there is a content folder that it can be used. And um, then it created this remote um, content path with help file and images at the end. So this is just to show you again what I've just displayed in the table. Um, let's have a look what we see down here. The device is obviously the device name, so the network name, how the computer is named. So um, the directory, well, we've talked about this long enough right now. Uh, it's the path where I can find the file. Um, by the way, um, if you want to check it, for example, there's a nice feature. Um, you can simply make a right click um, 
here and say reveal in Windows Explorer. So what's happening is that the Windows Explorer is opening and it displays me here the file name. So that's just as a side note, it's quite handy to then see um, maybe uh, some other information, uh, some properties of, of this file or um, is it really there or whatever you might want to check with it. Or you can copy it from there, whatever. Um, the name is of course the file name. So even if I would, even if I renamed it up here, uh, let's be creative, I call it test, um, then the name still sticks to the original um, tiger.jpg name. The status in my case is completed because it was loaded, um, it was spread and load on the, loaded on the, uh, on the client as well. So both lines down here say it's completed. Other status information um, could be, for example, um, while it is spreading, it says here zero to 100%. Um, Another place where you can see this information is also in the task manager. Um, when I look it up in, here we go, task manager. So here you see also the same information for all the files. Um, so if you want to know um, where am I, what's the status right now, how many files are still going to be spread, then the file, uh, then the task manager is a good place. Um, so zero to 100%. If it reached the 100%, it will turn to completed. Or if um, it's, for example, cannot be read by the um, target system, maybe because um, the target system doesn't have the, um, what's it called, uh, the decoder to play it. Maybe you used some more exotic video source, for example, um, a video codec, and you have the, uh, uh, you've, you've copied the codec to your manager and you can play it back there, but you haven't copied it to the um, target machine, and then the target machine doesn't understand what this file is and cannot play it back. This would be one reason why it could be inconsistent. Another reason could be um, because the file uh, size is maybe too large. Mm, should have looked this up. But I think currently we allow all machines to play back 4K files, even the compact player. Um, so if you have, for example, a video that is larger than 4K, it will then show up here that it's inconsistent because of your breaking the license um, that comes with the compact player. I hope I'm not wrong with the 4K information. <laughs> yes, that's correct. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mike. <laughs> I knew that we we put it up to 4K, but I wasn't really sure whether it's still like this. Um, for images, this limitation does not take place, so you can um, display larger images, but for videos it does. Um, Sometimes it also happens that there was a small hiccup during the spreading um, course. So uh, if you spread files and um, for example, it already got loaded, but it wasn't finished like the last small tiny percentage, then it also could say inconsistent. And what I then normally do is I select it here after checking that it's really, that it can really be displayed on, on the machine. And I simply reload it using this button here. Um, so what's then happening if I, just do it. This is him, for example, you see for, it's just loading it again. It's just going to the same path that is saved here and just loading again to make sure that we have the um, actual state from it. Media duration is of course the playback duration. So if we have here a video, it will then show us whether it's 10 seconds or whatever. Um, oh, I forgot one status, um, aborted. Sometimes you see here also the information aborted. And this means, uh, <clears throat> for example, that the spread got interrupted, either because you clicked cancel spread, so you did that manually, or because there was a, a network problem and the spreading function still just couldn't go on and it's just half the file there on the, um, on the target path. Mm. 
or sometimes it also happens that the target drive is just too full and cannot take up anymore. So then it's also saying aborted. So in that case, you could, for example, um, remove it and um, spread it again after checking that your network is okay and your drive space is okay. Mm -hmm. Software to the information up here. Um, the buttons down here, I've already used some of them. Um, the remove button just deletes the link entry. So as we said, we are just saving um, where, where Pandora's box can find the file. Um, it's not removing it. It's not removing the, the physical hard copy from it on the, on the network drive, um, uh, network location. Um, if we want to get it back, we could, for example, just spread it again. The spread bu uh, button does absolutely the same as the spread function up here. So if I remove it again, make a right click and say spread to all, it's happening again here and I see here my path again. The reload, I've mentioned it already, it's simply again um, to tell Pandora's box reload the file. Um, this is also happening um, when you reload your entire project. So when you save it, close Pandora's box, open it again, load your project. All files that are part of the project are reloaded. So Pandora's box checks, um, is the file still there? Does it have a newer date stamp, for example? Do I need to update it? And if it's not there, it will be displayed with a red exclamation mark so that we know it's inconsistent. Mm, the copy button, um, to be honest, does something funny in this version. Um, in the manual, it says that you can copy a file. So for example, during a rehearsal, um, you see that this image, um, I don't know, there needs to be something that was a typo in there and you need to correct it. So you want to give it to your, um, to, to the content creator. So um, what you could do, for example, is you, uh, if we just remove it here and say copy, you could select your compact player and say, I want to co the copy of the file again to some other folder or for example, to an external drive that I, um, to a USB stick that I plugged in here. Um, so it's just copying the file again to a second location. Um, however, right now in this version, it creates a different path, which it shouldn't do. So I've written it down when I tested this. Um, so just so that you know, this is what it should do and it will do it again with the next version or well, uh, an upcoming version. The attach function is in itself a, a powerful feature. So I want to go back once to the um, PowerPoint and talk about some um, examples. Indeed, you know what? I will just show it to you once how, what, what it, so that you get an idea. Um, currently, let's, for example, say, um, I have here this, I think that was a tiger. Yes, it was our tiger. Um, so my preview displays here a big tiger image. My compact player doesn't because it was not spread there. What I can do now is if I click here the attach button, um, I can choose the compact player and uh, just some other source. Uh, <laughs> That's a funny example. Um, so what's now happening? Hmm. What should have happened is that it should show me a different image. Mm.
Uh, let's just do this again with another file. Um, I have some. So here I have an image. Uh, I don't really know why my compact player is not showing the same file. So here we are. This is why I'm nervous. <laughs> uh, so here we see the preview and um, we see the same image uh, in the compact player as in the preview. Um, if I now, for example, take the compact player and remove this entry and now I could attach Uh, let's take this again. Here we go. Um, so now what's happening is my compact player loads a different file because I told it so, uh, than my manager does. The attaching function uh, is very important to, to add here. What you can attach to another file is always needs to be of the fa same file type. Um, when I did my live in Put webinar. Um, Thomas was a little mistaken um, because he thought there was a time when he did it, but uh, it turned out that he just remembered uh, wrongly. So what you can attach to an image is another image, but no video. What you can attach to a video is a video, but no other file. And the same goes for live inputs. Um, so what you can attach to a live input is always another live input and no image. Um, we had a quite large discussion after the last webinar again, because we just, um, uh, everybody of us uh, would like to do this. And we totally see why, uh, why this would be um, yeah, helpful in, in, in programming, because the default situation, how it is right now, is that the live input simply is it's located where the input board is uh, physically connected to the system. So when you load in live input, it's just showing um, on the client where the uh, live input board is physically uh, connected to, um, but not in the manager's preview. So you don't have any feedback of what's happening on the client. Um, so many times what people try to do is they attach some kind of image so that at least you see in the preview um, what the client is doing. Um, but there just doesn't seem to be a way, um, an easy way how we can program this. Um, however, we, we try to attack this um, and try to find our way through it and make a, make a workaround. Um, it just gets utterly complicated. So um, as, at least in in midterm, um, there won't be a solution for, for this thing. And yeah, again, uh, uh, for this uh, wrong information in the live input webinar. Um, but now I've already shown you some examples. I just switch once back to the PowerPoint presentation um, because we have reached our second, uh, uh, the next point in here, um, some examples for the attach feature. Um, the first one I've already mentioned with the live inputs. So you can attach another live input to, uh, to a live input. This is working. So if you have a, uh, for example, an HDMI card on the client and you have another one on your manager, 
you can um, uh, if you uh, you can split the signal um, and connect it to both systems and then attach the manager's live input to the client's live input and if you then drag the content onto the timeline um, both machines will display their live input what it's also used for is um, for example if you want to load different file versions um, for example a lower resolution or a different codec for example uh, one that is maybe not so performance uh, intense as the one that you are using on the client because maybe your manager is not equipped with um, yeah so powerful hardware um, with the lower resolution um, there is one small thing that I wanted to add to this um, let's go back to the manager ones um, if we go to this 4k image from the tiger or yeah um, there is one function in Pandora's box um, under local preview. So if I go to the configuration tab and the local settings, the local preview, I can check the option use thumbnails for preview. And what it does is it uses a low res image instead of the real content. This is also happening when you use videos. So uh, when I drag the video from here and put it on the timeline, I would see it playing on the client, but on the preview, I would just see the thumbnail, a still thumbnail, still image thumbnail. Um, this is a very nice feature if you are just using so much content and you still want to see something in your preview. Um, however, the uh, one small drawback from it is that those thumbnails, of course, are really small. Um, they, if you want to check them, um, they sit in the project path where you have saved it. And uh, in the, wait a sec, content projects, temp projects, and the local cache and then the thumbs folder. So here we will see our tiger somewhere. There it is. And here we also see that it's 256 pixels only. Um, so if you, want, if you want to somehow save performance on your manager, but not so much performance, you could, for example, choose to use the attach function. Um, you could scale down the, um, so of course you would take this option out. You would scale down the tiger image using a different um, software and and then use the attach function down here. So you attach a lower res picture to it. So whenever you drag the content on here, you see the high res content on your client and the lower res content on the manager. However, what I've stumbled over yesterday is when you are using the default layer sizing mode media pixel size you will notice that your content in the manager gets a little smaller because of course it has a lower resolution um, but still i think it's a you just need to know about it this is how pandora's box is working um, so you can either change the layer sizing mode um, or you well you just remember this behavior um, and it's still fine because you have a very a good resolution for the for the manager, and you simply do not care about the uh, the camera rectangle, for example. Another example for the attaching function is um, when, for example, many clients share the uh, share a canvas of what content. So, for example, you have um, eight projectors next to, next to each other and they are connected to um, to maybe two or three or four servers and they all show one big image or one case that i've actually worked on is um, it was a big museum and well the, the rooms they literally had no walls it was just covered by uh was it lcd yes lcd screens so uh, you walked in and all what you saw was just, it was covered with LCD walls, uh, screens. Um, 
and they played back one file uh, that went around the entire room. Um, they actually had a cluster of four. So four screens were connected to one compact player that was mounted just behind them. Um, and the quadrant setup was done with using the LCD uh, software in there. So they had one cable connected from the compact player to the first um, screen, uh, which was set up to use the first quadrant. And then they simply daisy chained it to the second, third, and fourth, and each display just took out their own quadrant. Um, but still, we ended up using, I can't remember anymore, and we had in one room, it was players um, responsible only for this one room. And the second room um, had maybe only 30, um, but the next one had like, eight. so um, it was in, in this museum. And now we need to talk a little bit about um, not venue sites, this is the topic for tomorrow, but virtual sites. Virtual sites in Fundverse Box allow you um, to, uh, to combine many machines to a virtual machine where you can then uh, program content on, which is easier than copying it 50 times. So let's have a look in Fundverse Box. I will just clear this. And then I will show you why the attaching function makes so much sense in using it. I'll just delete this too. Try again. Um, so if we had a second compact player, I will just check the license compact single. If I have player compact single, if I have a second compact player down here, um, it's not connected right now because I, I don't have unlimited dongles at home, um, but I can just mimic it if I select them and create a virtual site out of it. I get a new ID, number four, and now I have here the virtual layers. If I put some content on here, um, it will be displayed on both clients, on my compact player here and on my other compact player uh, at the same time. Um, However, if you think about maybe 50 compact players showing one big image, you of, of course understand that the image needs to be a really, really high resolution. And it's not really performant to load a huge resolution file onto a small compact player and then tell actually you are just seeing this fifth of the image. It makes much more sense to split it up. Um, if you split it up, you might get 50 different slices of this one image and you have to program 50 slices down here, which um, is a possibility. Um, but the more complex your, like if you have maybe a virtual site of two or three systems, um, I would most likely go this way and simply program three containers down here and each being the, uh, the content for the respective system. Um, however, if you're show gets more complex and you need to add a lot of fades in their um, opacity fades and or on other uh, effect stuff, uh, position stuff, transitions, all that um, things. Or if you start to move contents around, you always have to think about using all the, selecting all the containers and doing the stuff what you want to do. So adding keys or moving them in time, etc. So not only is this, um, prone to errors because you always have to think about selecting all of them, but also it's very, um, well, it's not really nice to keep an overview just because of the space that we have here. Of course, you can use larger screens, um, uh, but but still I, I, at one point it just gets, it, you just lose the overview and you cannot really work anymore. So at this point, um, which I have reached when I was at this museum and I decided, okay, I'm not going to program 50 containers. This is just silly. So what I've done is I used the attach function and I used widget designer to help me. Um, so this is what it looked like when 
oh, and actually to make it more complicated, it was at a time when the content was still being produced. Um, so I got like sometimes three or four or five times a day, I got new content for the entire museum. So for like 150 compact players, I got files. So what I did is, um, I had folders, which um, uh, which I copied only to the compact player. So the manager indeed knew nothing about the content. Um, then, oh, I'm starting to complicate it. Let's, let's just do it one, a simple example. Um, so what I can now do is I just drag the left content in here. and the right content and because I don't have the second compact player let's try to make a case where I see here the right half and in my client I want to see the left half and I only want to program one container so first this is my left half I go down here, I select in this case my local machine and I say that I want to remove it and I now want to attach on my local machine um, the right content which sits under C, content, images, right, forest, okay. Toggle preview helps. Um, so what I now see is on my left compact player, I see the left half. On my right um, preview, in this case, I see the right half of the content. So in the museum, what I did is when I got new content, it was actually a, a network uh, a network server. Um, so I copied the uh, folders for each compact player only to the compact player that needed it on the one hand because I knew it will change in like two or three hours again and um, on the other side I didn't want um, yeah to eat up all the network performance just by spreading and spreading and spreading it everywhere where it didn't need to go and um, only on the on the very last week I started to make copies to it to the manager but um, during the entire show uh, programmation um, I, yeah, the manager just didn't know about this. So I had only one file in here, which was kind of like my dummy file. And I had here my one container where I did all the, the fade ins and the, the trigger points also because it was hooked up with other elements um, during the show. Um, so I had here all my queuing done in one container. And when I received new content, I checked this one. I selected an entry from a compact player, I removed it and attached then the new version of the file. Um, of course, I didn't do this manually with all the compact players per room. I used widget designer to do this. Um, so using, using the attach function for, for some files or for some systems is totally fine. But as soon as you have a complex show like in this museum case, um, it's just um, too time consuming to do this manually. So, widget designer. So first of all, <clears throat> I of course had a button. So I would just create a custom script button, uh, this one. And I had a function in here, which did the removing part. So uh, this is actually, oh, am I hooked up already? Uh, let me just double check. Okay. 
so my widget designer is connected to the manager and the command for it is actually the detach. Now there are two versions. I can either detach or attach a file by using the ID, which in my case was not um, well so useful because I didn't have them in the manager, hence they didn't have an ID. So I used the um, longer version by using the path. And uh, let me just drag it over here so you, you can see all the information. So what is happening here is <clears throat> I start with giving the path from uh, from from the file how it is saved in the project top from the manager, and then I detach um, the number uh, of the system, uh, the ID, the site ID. Um, so first I ah uh, There is actually no subfolder. Uh, if I had a subfolder, I would just call it like this uh, folder and then use the backslash. If I don't have any of this, I simply say I want to detach the forest L JPEG and I want to detach number three. Ah, that's not number three. It just, oh, it is number two. So this was actually what I was looking for. My compact player um, in the virtual side has the ID number two. So let me just correct this in here. So now what we see is that this file entry is removed the link down here in order to attach it again mm. let's use this already because we have the path in here so the attach command works in the same way i can use the file path and I'm lazy, so I'm just taking it from here. So I take the same image, I take the same site ID, and now I tell it to go to the, to the file path from the hard drive. So this is not the, the path from the project anymore, but from the hard drive. So let's see. Uh, Christy, content huh. Oh, I forgot the images. <sighs> so this is what you end up with when you want to be spontaneous. Ah, oh, come on. Compact, Chrissy content images left. What was our JPEG number two? See Christy content images left forest owl. Hmm. 
Okay. Mm. No, I don't see any more bots. What am I doing wrong? Let's attach my files first. Oh, okay. Good. Should have prepared this, I'm sorry. Um, but this is, <laughs> once you've prepared it, it was really fast. So um, actually, in, indeed, what I did with my um, 50 compact pairs, I used a for loop. So I said um, count from 1 to 50. And instead of using here the ID, I simply used the the index that the for loop is creating. So number one, number two, number three, etc. And the file path was always the same um, because I told the uh, the content producers to simply leave the file name in here um, and then copy it to a folder that was named after the compact player. So I knew, okay, this folder needs to go to the third compact player um, and, and so on. Uh, but the file name itself was the same. Um, just to make it easier in here. Um, and I think at the end, I also used here a variable because I had different rooms and the different rooms had different content um, and also different shows where they had different content. So at the end, I had always, um, I kind of checked, okay, I have this room now. This is now my current file version, uh, file name um, that I want to remove and attach again and it placed the, the variables differently. And then I had two buttons, which did this thing in, in milliseconds. Um, and I had kind of my, my surveillance camera and I saw there on my black and white screen um, how all the compact players da, 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 switched their content, um, which was quite nice to see. Um, yeah, so far to this use case. And I see that I've already touching the one hour mark. Um, is there anything that you want to know about this one example about the attaching function? Um, maybe you can let Mike know the question and I would just switch back to my presentation to see where we can save a little time. But I think we are already quite far. Just cancel this. Go down here. All right. Um, Yes, we've done this as well. We attached files using the widget designer. Um, the last example is quite fast. Um, if you have inconsistent media files, maybe because you dragged in some content already to your um, project and later on you decided to rename the content. Um, so again, what Pandora's box is saving is simply the link to the file. If the location, of course, changes, the link is not valid anymore and we display it as inconsistent files. So what you can then do is you can remove the old link and attach the new link. Um, again, using widget designer makes sense if you start to uh, reach a high number of systems or if you know that you have to do it a couple of times. Um, one thing that I wanted to add here talking about moving files and renaming folders. Um, at the end, we had the question about what's a good location for the content. If you, uh, da, 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 if you've saved this uh, project once, say project, and we call it webinar, for example, and I go to the Windows Explorer and Let me just take this, those two files and go to the webinar folder under content projects, webinar, where I saved this file, a folder was created, which is named assets. In here, if I copy my files, um, or my entire folder structure, of course. 
Um, what is now possible in Pandora's box is you can access it with the project assets down here. So when I double click it, I see now oops, my, my content that I've copied in here. And when I drag it into my, of uh, course, copy, when I drag it into my project, you will so now see the directory assets. This means it's not a direct link anymore that we save, but we save a relative path. What this is uh, meaning is simply look on the folder named assets next to the location where the project was saved to. So now what you can do if you want to give your um, if you want to give your project including all the content to another person, you just save this folder, um, copy it to another system, load it there, and all your content can be loaded without any problem because it sits directly there and the relative files uh, filings were saved. Um, you can also use the bundle feature for this later on if you later on decide to do this, but I think it's a nice feature to start with it right away um, for some shows, of course. If you are always using the same content for different shows, it makes sense to use a different file structure. Um, but if you use unique content only for the project, you might just go ahead and use the project assets um, function um, down here. Mm, this should be it for the examples. The very last information that I wanted to talk about is the cached files. Um, just because it is a little bit a confusing topic if you don't know the backgrounds of Pandora's box, what it is doing. I'm trying to keep this very short so we don't spend too much time on this um, last part of the webinar. Cached files. I'm pretty sure that once upon a time you already stumbled over this. Um, in the preview, we see our image here, um, which is not this one. If you're confused, um, like <laughs> I am right now, what is actually the image that we see right now here? You can also make a right click and say reveal in project tree. And what it does is it selects this for us and shows the information in the inspector, which is a super nice thing. Um, so right now I see that my local preview is loading this file. When I go to the Windows Explorer and I mm, first copy it so that I have a backup and I delete this thing. Pandora's box is still showing it. If I get that out of the container and go in, it's still showing it. If I now go and select this entry and press the reload button, now it's the first time it actually says, wait a second, the uh, file is not there anymore in this directory. The status is actually inconsistent. This reloading is also happening when you reload the entire project, um, as I mentioned before. So um, when you want to double check, uh, when you've done this for many, many files and you just lost the overview, which files are actually there and not, simply save your project, reload it again, and then you will see all those red exclamations mark popping up. Um, if you just want to check it for one file, you can use this um, uh, reload button down here. Um, but why was it showing for such a long time until we actually said reload? Like, where was it still um, positioned? Um, for images, there is a special thing. We, even for uncompressed images, like for um, bitmaps or for PNGs, um, even then we decompress the image into a format that we can give to the graphics card and that it can display right away. Indeed, that is a uh, you might know the DDS format, and uh, it's just a DDS e file that we uh, create. And we save this file into the cached folder. So let me just check whether it's still somewhere here. No. Projects, webinar, local cache, and the content. <clears throat> Ah, 
Uh, I think it was still situated in the temp folder. Um, it doesn't matter. It sits in here in the local cache folder and um, uh, it's generated when you are loading the project. Um, so for images, we kind of decompress them and we save this internal file link. And only when you say actually, okay, look at the file again, um, then it's changing to inconsistent. We are not showing the local cached file anymore. Um, the same thing is actually happening with videos. Um, so the decoder, or actually it depends on the, on the extension that you are using. But in most cases, the decoder that is responsible for playing back the video file, it takes the entire file, loads it into like a, uh, like a small memory, a short memory, and place back the file. So even if you delete the video, in some cases, you might still be able to see it in the preview playing back or in the client. Um, but only when you then go out of the container and go back in, then this memory is lost, it got discarded, and you cannot see the video anymore. Um, this just as a background information, um, why this uh, status is sometimes not updated automatically. Mm, uh, when we talk about deleting files in it itself. When you edit files, and this is the very last information that I want to include in this webinar, if you edit files, Pandora's box automatically loads them. So you do not need to press the reload button just because you know somebody edited the file, added some text, for example. Um, for default, mm, under resources, yes. Under resources, we have um, the option to monitor the changes that happen to the files um, we have included in the project um, when those ch changes happen on the disk version. So if we see that there's a new timestamp, it's automatically reloaded and um, uh, displayed in Pandora's box. This, however, does not happen when you remove it because there is no newer timestamp. Um, when you when you delete it. So we are simply using our cached files for this. Yeah, last option, of course, is that you also um, auto spread those changed files to your uh, clients um, just yeah, to complete this um, configuration information here. So um, oof, would have never guessed that I could fill up 70 minutes with that. <laughs> but thank you very, very much for your attention. Um, I will just wait a little more whether you have many, uh, any other questions for this. Um, I hope this was informative and you got um, some information out of this and was interesting um, so far. I would also say thank you to Mike. Uh, let me just, these are our usual links. Of course, um, when you want to see other webinars, just go, oh, thank you, Mike. He's just posting yep. the link from the chat. Um, uh, yeah, on Facebook and our website, you will see all the other webinar dates. Um, for the help file, indeed, there's one link that I wanted to share with you um, where I pretty much got all the information out for this webinar. It's uh, directly in the file location table. So I've opened it up for you once here. Um, he will see all the information. So what's, uh, what was this thing about file handling and the link stuff? How is Pandora's box spreading? Here we have the table with the source path and the target path. Um, again, the information about the different status stuff, the buttons and the examples that I've just been through. Also with the, um, the attach and the detach command, if you want to copy it for your next project maybe. Um, yeah, so far, I think I didn't forget anything. I surely added more information than I actually intended to. <laughs> <laughs> but so far, thank you for watching. And uh, I hope we can welcome you tomorrow with the webinar about venue sites. <laughs> yeah, thank you also. Okay, for my side. thank you guys. Thanks, Mike.